Hello, everybody. We'll give everyone a minute to join the Zoom webinar. I see the numbers trickling in here. And I love seeing some familiar faces here in the crowd. It's so wonderful to have you joining us today for our capstone presentations of the executive program in news innovation and leadership. Like I said, we will get started here in just a moment as people trickle in. We're so excited to have you join us today. And as you're joining, please feel free uh, to introduce yourself in the chat, include your name, uh, what you do for work, where you work, um, and where you're currently located right now. It'd be wonderful uh, to see all of you. Hello, hello. All right. I see the number still trickling in here, but we will slowly get started. Hi, Eden. So good to see you. Alexandra, one of our wonderful coaches. Awesome. It is so good to, to see all, all of you here in the chat. So please continue uh, to introduce yourself. Um, we're really excited to have you all joining us today. I want to just welcome everybody to um, the Reimagining News Leadership and Innovation in the Age of Digital Disruption. Uh, this is uh, a webinar that features 23 incredible media executives and leaders from around the world um, who have just completed their year-long journey as participants in the executive program in news innovation and leadership at the Craig Newmark Graduate School of Journalism at CUNY. Uh, these presentations that they're going to be delivering today uh, are the culmination of their capstone projects that they've been working on during this time. Uh, my name is Kyle Plants. I am the Senior Program Manager of our professional development programs here at the school. It has been a true honor and privilege to be able to work with these amazing people for this past year. Um, before we get started, though, um, I have some logistics to run through. But before I do that, I want to invite Nikita Patel, our Program Director, to say a few words. Hello, everybody, and welcome. My name is Nikita Patel, Senior Director of Leadership Programs here at Newmark J School at CUNY. Thank you so much for joining us for this virtual event titled Reimagining News Leadership and Innovation in the Age of Digital Disruption. I generated this timely title for this event using BARD, which is Google's generative AI chatbot. Since this event and our program celebrates and focuses on news innovation and leadership. Today, you'll see final presentations from our fantastic program participants. Some of them will share highlights from their capstone project, and some will be sharing key learnings from our program. The premise of a capstone project is to identify problems or challenges in one's newsroom or in the media industry at large, and then to showcase possible outcomes, strategies, and solutions. We're really excited to hear from our cohort today. I want to thank Jeff Jarvis and Anita Zialina for their leadership as founders of this important program. Thank you to Marie Zillo, Kyle Plants, and Divine Life Williams, my wonderful team who helped make this program and today possible. I also wanna thank our instructors and our coaches for their expertise and guidance and our funders who have made participation possible for many people in this cohort, which include the Google News Initiative, Media Lab Bayern, the Knight Foundation, and CUNY Center for Community Media. And I wanna thank all of you for joining us today. I'll now pass it back to Kyle to kick things off with our first presenter. Thank you so much, Nikita. All right, so just a few ground rules and also some um, quick notes here as we uh, get ready to kick off our presentations. Um, we want this chat to be as interactive as possible throughout uh, our presentations today. So um, many of our presenters are here in person um, and uh, also here virtually. So they will be able to answer any questions you might have about their presentation in the chat. Um, so please ask questions um, and continue to uh, celebrate the amazing work that they've been doing throughout the presentations today. I also just want to highlight, make sure that you are sending the messages in the chat uh, to everyone and not just the pan host and panelists. So you can change that setting as you're typing in the chat here. So double check that um, as you are getting started here. 
We are in Midtown Manhattan right now, um, and I'm not sure about you, uh, but it has been a crazy week with travel delays, and so we're really excited to have all of our cohort here together, um, but we also, in person, um, but we also have uh, two of our participants virtually right now in India, and we're really excited um, to have everyone together for our presentations. Because we are in the heart of Times Square right now, um, you might hear the occasional horn go off or anything. Um, that's the beauty of New York City, um, and so we're really, uh, you know, uh, thank you for being patient with us um, with any outside noises here. And of course, as I mentioned, if you have any questions throughout the presentations um, for the presenter, um, feel free to throw them in the chat and they will be able to see them and respond once they are done. With that, um, I would like to introduce our first presenter, Prabha, um, who is in India right now. Prabha is the editor of Wall Street Journal Pro and oversees the Wall Street Journal's product offerings for targeted professional audiences. Prabha, thank you for joining us. Hi. Good morning, everyone. Thanks so much for joining me. Um, today, I wanted to talk to you about a new model of collaboration that helps both local and legacy news organizations reach broader and diverse audiences based on clear revenue strategies. And of course, the challenges of doing something like this. Uh, the idea for this actually started with my cohort. Um, I can't believe we started the journey a year ago. It feels like a lifetime ago. Um, we've come a long way since then. Uh, the idea for it is because we have a lot of local um, news founders and in addition, people who work with startups. And this got me thinking about how, as I work in a legacy news organization, I can be part of this revival of journalism, if you will. And um, I, it got it made me think about the Sunday Journal, which, if you're not familiar, used to be uh, a single sheet that was part of newspapers across the country back in the heyday of print journalism. At that time, it reached at its peak, it reached 11 million homes, 84 newspapers, and was profitable both to the local and legacy news organizations. This, of course, died down with the decline in print journalism. Today, I propose a digital redo of this idea uh, based on the need for collaboration. Local new startups have done a fantastic job of creating new pipelines and engagement models that help them connect with audiences and communities. Of course, the challenge is we all look to create information portals that are based uh, on journalism and be able to meet a, all of the needs of the, our audiences for these local startups could be uh, providing a variety of information that their users may need. This is something that national organizations and larger media groups like, like the journal have plenty of, but what they struggle to do is of course, reach the local and diverse audiences. My model would be something that suggests a based on a collaboration focused on service journalism with, create, with clear outcomes, which is reach and revenue. Part of this is inspired by Jeff Jarvis's paper a while ago, but where he clearly talks about how news organizations aren't you know, in isolation, they can't exist in isolation, and they exist in media technolo technology and information ecosystem, and how collaboration and sharing should be pillars of what we create. Um, the proposed project is a re digital redo of the Sunday journalism, firmly focused on personal finance. As we all know, across readership, in, across generation, across minority groups, personal finance, wealth generation is a topic that resonates with everyone. And the journal has the capacity and the ability to clearly and to you know, advocate for um, ideas and ways to help people build their personal wealth. We would start with a newsletter that we've created, the journal has created called Money Challenge. It's a six part newsletter where it asks people to invest both time and money in their financial health. The local news organization would create awareness about this collaboration and, their, and tout their relationship with the journal possibly. And through this awareness, draw people to sign up for emails. And once the email journey begins, um, it creates engagement with the newsletter 
and eventually a desire to stay informed both on the topic and to also stay connected to the local news organization and also create an awareness of the products that the journal can offer. I believe it also creates opportunities for local and national sponsorship, branded content, events, workshops, and community outreach. Most of this idea, of course, is grounded on the, on the belief that we should create information portals for our readers where they come to us for all of their news, news needs, where we as journalists are able to provide this news, um, news and information um, need that is backed by journalism and that can help regain the trust with our readers. Of course, everything comes with challenges. My challenge has been, of course, to get this project started and off the ground, something I'm still working on. And in addition, I do see that some of the technology and the ability to share both users and resources may be a concern that would need to be solved. But those are pro projects I hope to work on in the coming months and year. If any of you want to reach out to me and chat more about this, I look forward to this. Thank you so much for your time today. Thank you so much, Prava. Thank you so much for being here and joining us in India, where I believe it's almost 10 p.m. your time. <laughs> Thank you. Righty. Um, I will introduce the next person um, who will be presenting after Prava. Um, once Prabha, uh, can you unshare your screen, please? Thank you. All righty. Very quickly here. Our next presenter is Pankaj. Uh, he is the co-founder of Factor Daily, a nonprofit journalism lab based in Bangalore, India. Uh, he loves telling stories to communities and formats including physical spaces and one-on-one -on -one beyond the digital social noise. Pankaj is also joining us from India right now, so we're very excited to have him. Thank you so much for being here, Pankaj. Hi everyone, I'm really grateful and thrilled to be here. Uh, today I'm going to be sharing the story of a failed media startup Factor Daily and how it became a nonprofit and a sustainable journalism lab. Now, as a failed entrepreneur, I'm used to feeling quitting almost every day, but we don't quit. Uh, in fact, in this program too, there were several times when, when the thought of uh, quitting or dropping out of the program crossed my mind, but I never did because entrepreneurs keep building, founders build. They don't quit until it, it is absolutely impossible. So I'm really grateful to be here. Over the past year, two questions have shaped the journey of Factor Daily and the, my capstone too. The first question, how can I take journalism closer to people in communities, also away from the digital and social noise? And the second question is how to find funding that's just beyond your advertisements, grants, and subscriptions. The, the biggest learning I had on this journey is when stories travel to a healing space, a community space, journalism finds its purpose. In November last year, uh, we told this story of a founder who had failed multiple times, uh, his family quit on him, and he had to spend months getting treatment for his mental health challenges. Now, startups are a mainstream social movement in India, but nobody comes forward to talk failures because it's considered shameful, a stigma. We chronicled Sunny Ghosh's story uh, to, in, a, in a community of around a few dozen founders, and we invited Sunny to share his story with the community first. In that room that day, the connections were formed, story traveled through the community spaces, and I felt joy. I also found fulfillment uh, for the first time in my over two decades of journalism. It happened because within weeks of that session, a bunch of founders reached out to us and requested us to incubate a new community project, which will keep doing this among the founders, which will do this on an ongoing basis. 
So we incubated this project. We call it Jaga, which is an Urdu word. It means space in English. It's a space where founders would gather, share their war stories, and also their mental health problems. Within months, uh, we told this story to uh, in across many sessions, and we even received contributions worth over 100K without us even asking for those contributions. We replicated the same model to another story where we even handcrafted a comic book as a giveaway for people who were attending the session. There were around 100 of them. And I had the same feeling of joy and fulfillment from journalism for the first time, if I speak honestly. For this project too, we raised 50K without even asking for donations. The, both these story projects are now profitable uh, inside the nonprofit uh, Factor Daily Media Lab. Behind all of this, I found a team of three people who believed in Factor Daily's mission. Somesh, who breathes life into our uh, stories and narrative spaces with his visuals, Seher, who leads the community efforts, and my co-founder, Shadma. The four of us have bet the next 10 years of our careers on Factor Daily's mission. The other big question staring at us was how can we find a revenue model beyond ads and subscriptions? We started exploring uh, journalism as education, offering journalism as education to other nonprofits, and that took off. A few months ago, we started offering focus workshops about uh, how to tell stories, how to uh, create visual languages, how to curate communities and so on across focus workshops, across different cohorts. A large edtech uh, nonprofit called Akestep in India, it became an anchor customer and we raised our corpus grants of around 125K. This led us to my biggest realization on this journey, the intersection of joy, fulfillment, livelihood, absolutely, and the human scale impact is how we are now measuring the impact of journalism for us. There are some learnings, some uh, notes uh, from the field that I want to finally share with all of you. Doing things that don't scale in the age of AI and opaque algorithms is quite fulfilling, and we have tried it. The product mission fit is more uh, important and fulfilling than just chasing the product market fit. We also believe now that one is an audience too. We have told our stories one-on-one -on -one to hundreds of people over the past eight months. And we also now believe that ownership is highly overrated. When we allow stories to travel freely, it nurtures communities and it also forms a collective ownership, something that, that we need so urgently. Thank you so much for listening to me. I'm grateful to CUNY and everyone there uh, if you have any questions or you want to engage, do drop in a note. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you. Good job, thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, and thank you so much again for being here. We're really excited to have you. Um, thank you to our, uh, our wonderful members of our cohort who are here uh, in India. Um, thank you for joining us. Um, and uh, the rest of our cohort um, is here with us here in, uh, in New York City. So we're excited to, to turn uh, the presentations over to them. Keep the uh, chat going. Uh, if you have questions uh, for any of the presentations, the presenters, they're here, they can answer them. Um, and any resources or relevant um, items that uh, you are, you know, that are relevant to the presentations, please feel free to share them in the chat too. We really want this to be collaborative and open for everybody. I will now introduce our next presenter here once I share my screen. Perfect. And our next presenter uh, is Carolina. Uh, Carolina is a Colombian journalist uh, who has spent the last years working on community and citizen journalism projects in her native country. Um, she currently directs um, Continente, a project created in 2019 by the Foundation for Press Freedom uh, to combat the spread of news deserts in Colombia. So welcome, Carolina. Hi, everybody. As Kyle said, my name is Carolina Arteta Caballero. I'm a journalist, and during the past four years of my life, I've dedicated my mind, my heart, and most of my energy to shape Consonante, 
a citizen journalism lab created by the Foundation for Press Freedom in Colombia. We conceived Consonante as a strategy to combat the spread of news deserts in my country, but it has outgrown its mission. Today, Consonante functions as a newsroom that brings together people who are part of communities that have often been stigmatized and overlooked by other media organizations. It sounds great, right? The problem is I often receive phrases like this one thrown my way. Civic journalism is dead. It was a thing maybe 10 years ago. Or these ones. And I have created these thoughtful answers to the majority of these questions and phrases, but to be honest, I have thought to myself, why am I doing this if civic journalism is dead? Am I crazy? Well, I might be a little bit crazy, but that's another story. I believe the comments I have received speak of a problem hidden in the roots of the media industry. They serve as a proof of an exclusionary mindset that somehow prevails in journalism. One, that gives power to the idea that only those who've had had the privilege of receiving formal education can be considered legitimate journalists. Newly trained journalists on the other side and community-centered media organizations that do some kind of participatory or civic journalism, just like Consonante, are often overlooked and disregarded. These people are unfairly labeled as second-class workers with their expertise and contributions undermined. And I know this also has to do with the misconception of the term civic journalism. So for my capstone project, I set out to interview journalists working in community-centered organizations or civic journalism projects to find a way of properly defining what we do. Speaking with them made me realize that there is a lot that our colleagues can work, learn from the work we do. So I took the liberty of putting together a list of 10 pieces of advice that I'm going to share with you. Of course, you may find more information in my capstone project. First, don't ignore that inner voice that tells you that traditional media is not doing enough. One common denominator the journalist I spoke with had is that at some points of their careers, they felt that there was something broken in the media ecosystem and that maybe, just maybe, by coming closer to people, they could find an answer. So if you've heard that voice, listen to it. Second, working with citizens can upgrade your journalism, but you must take it seriously. This means that token ways of involving community members are just not efficient to build trust. Three, be comfortable with the idea of sharing your power with others. This means, and this point is really important, this type of work requires openness and humility. For example, two, challenge your own points of view. Four, you must believe it's possible to train people to ask the right questions. Think of it like retraining your genuine curiosity, something that we, have, we had when we were little. And five, design your own method and stick to it. We know strong organizations in all the industries have strong values, but this is especially important in civic journalism. Think about things like, for example, having ways of getting a primary source when there are doubts about the information you publish. Six, listen, 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 and think again. In other words, be open to continue adjusting your method as you go. Seven, measure your impact and create coherent internal processes because without measuring what you do, you may think you're doing great, but know that results will take time. So find donors, sponsors, and stakeholders who understand this. Think about, for example, commission projects and public funding. Nine, trust your work because if it's good, others will follow. As comedian Steve Martin puts it, be so good, they can't ignore you. And number 10, always be prepared to fight for a seat at the table. So no, I don't think civic journalism is dead because the essence of what we do revolves around breaking free from outdated notions that have imposed useless limits to our profession and generated a ton of problems such as these. So are you willing to share your power? Thank you. Thank you so much, Carolina. Um, before we uh, introduce our next speaker, I just want to remind people uh, that we want to keep this chat obviously going and 
engaging here. So just as a reminder, please make sure that you are uh, switching uh, your conversation to everyone and not just hosts and panelists. Um, so that way that you can do um, be able to communicate with everyone in that way. Um, so our next speaker here is Madeline Baer. Uh, Madeline is the founding director of El Tinkpano, an award-winning local news and civic engagement organization designed with and for the Bay Area's Latino and Mayan immigrants. So I'm excited to invite Madeline to the stage. Hello, good morning, and thank you for being with us. We journalists love specificity. So when we define the challenges facing our industry, let's be specific. There is not a crisis in local journalism. There is a crisis in local journalism that covers and serves low-income communities. And the crisis is hitting immigrants and communities of color particularly hard. In just the past five years, the cities that have lost Spanish language newspapers include Dallas, Los Angeles, Chicago, and Tucson. In a recent survey of publishers whose local outlets serve communities of color, 53% stated that if current trends continue, their outlets will be out of business within five years. And it's not because their audiences are shrinking. It's because the revenue models that sustain local journalism leave low-income communities behind. This was true when advertising raked in profits for outlets that reach large or affluent audiences. In recent years, the business models of local news have changed, but the bias toward wealthy audiences remains. Outlets boast to sponsors of how wealthy and highly educated their audiences are. Reader revenue is successful as long as the audience can pay. Philanthropy can theoretically address these gaps, but in practice, it does the opposite. It supports journalism for the wealthy. A major study of foundation grants over six years found that that just 0.1% of funding went to local news serving low-income communities or communities of color. By and large, funding went to public media, universities, and a small handful of national outlets that serve largely white and well-to-do audiences. News is a business of the haves and the have-nots. And increasingly, low-income communities have nowhere to turn for journalism that reflects their stories, holds local officials to account, and informs them on issues of public health and democracy. They become easy targets of disinformation, corruption, and abuse. So as we as an industry design solutions to our challenges, let's be specific. Let's invest in strategies to sustain journalism that serves low-income communities. I'm the founder of El Timpano, a civic media organization designed with and for the Bay Area's Latino and Mayan immigrants. As a result of our participatory design process, we developed the first Spanish language SMS reporting platform, a platform that today reaches more than 10% of Oakland's Latino immigrant households and has been replicated by more than a dozen local outlets across the country. For years, despite the demonst demonstrated impact of our approach and widespread recognition among peers, peers, the fact that our audience was poor stood in the way of us attaining the funds we needed to serve them, grow, and thrive. So we designed our own revenue strategy, and we call it civic partnerships. Like advertising, civic partnerships monetizes our ability to connect partners with our audience. Unlike advertising, our partners aren't interested in selling goods. They're interested in providing information or listening to our audience. They're less interested in reaching the masses as they are in reaching communities they struggle to reach due to barriers of language, technology, and trust. Who are these partners? A community clinic that wants to ensure those most impacted by COVID-19 have the information they need to get vaccinated. A city department that wants to hear from residents where they want capital funds invested in their neighborhoods. In the past two years, civic partnerships have comprised El Timpano's fastest growing revenue stream, now representing one third of our income and propelling El Timpano's growth. And the best part is the strategy is aligned with our mission of fostering a more equitable and connected information ecosystem. Transparency and clear standards ensure that just like any other revenue stream, civic partnerships have no influence on our editorial independence. So driven by the interests we've heard from our audiences and community leaders, El Timpano plans to scale our work across the Bay Area to address the immense gap in local journalism that covers and serves the nearly 2 million Spanish-speaking immigrants who live and work in the region. And we've already begun. 
We're raising $1 million over three years to expand our newsroom and community engagement teams with the confidence that Civic Partnerships presents a clear path to Altipano's long-term revenue growth, diversification, and sustainability. This funding will also allow us to share this revenue strategy with other local newsrooms across the country serving low-income communities. Because prioritizing equity should not be a barrier to the sustainability of local news, but instead it should be part of the solution. Thank you. And if you'd like to invest in this solution or learn more, here's how you can reach out. Thank you. Thank you so much, Madeline. All righty, we're gonna keep the good vibes going here with our next speaker, Mark. Uh, he is a journalist and media entrepreneur and a consultant based in Barcelona. Uh, he is currently focused on consolidating and growing a group of legacy and digital local news brands to ensure their future sustainability. So Mark, we're excited to have you. Thank you, Kyle. Hi, hi everyone. I'm Marc Basté. I'm the founder and publisher of Group Edition de Rensa Local, a small media group based in Barcelona and focused on covering local news for the Catalan speaking population of around 8 million people. What follows is the story of my current adventure and how CUNY has boosted our plans. So it all started here in Sabadell, my hometown, just miles away from Barcelona, five years ago. After many years working with media groups abroad, I went back home and found myself the perfect project, saving the city's 165-year-old newspaper. I bought it along with some friends and investors, and in a couple of years, we got back its relevance and its revenues, winning many awards on the way. It was so fun and fulfilling, but COVID changed the plans, as many others. We were too small to survive in the post-COVID landscape, so we decided to think a little bigger and build, scale, integrated other print brands. Took the next step, an easy one, and bought the Aria Terrassa sister city and managed to do the same as it's a day, but much faster. We were not saving a newspaper anymore. We were creating a local news group, apparently, and becoming some sort of local hero for struggling publications in the area. But as fun as it was, we still needed much more digital scale to survive. And we bet it all on digital. We acquired Nacio Digital, a journalistic reference in the Catalan digital ecosystem with a strong focus on politics and 20 local editions with a central newsroom in Barcelona. So where are we now? Well, basically my little romantic project has gone a, a bit too far. We, we reached 40 local communities from 10 physical newsrooms. And most of it happened during the last 12 months with CUNY going on. So besides the increase of digital reach, what really happened this past year is that we went from a team of 15 people to a team of almost 100 professionals. And somehow just one little me running like crazy from new room to new room and flying to the CUNY residences to take a breath. This is me this last year. So Nacio, Nacio has been has given us the scale and dimension that we needed, but, we, but it also has brought a, a huge structural complexity. At this point, the group is a shapeless mass of brands and new rooms without any or, or very few strategic editorial product or business alignment. So we have it somehow all at once. Luckily, the financials are solid, so it, this gives us a little time, but still a lot, the challenge is big. So how do we build a media group out of this chaos? Well, we have a plan and we're developing a group strategy that accommodates all brands and audiences, projects a sustainable organization, and is ambitious enough to continue growing because we think that we're in more scale. So first things first, Everything in the end goes down to culture and everything starts from culture and value. So this project only makes sense if it serves the initial driving idea to build a stronger ecosystem of news in Catalan. And all the brands that, that integrate the group share some very essential values to build the culture. So we share local journalism DNA, we're all local brands, Catalan and its cultural heritage, the focus on community service and leadership and social relevance. That's our ambition. Second, the portfolio strategy and probably the most important part of the plan, this mass of brands needs to become pieces of a coherent group. So first we'll migrate all them to the same platform because they are spread in different platforms now, unifying all the digital capabilities. Then we'll restructure and refocus the brand. So Nacio will stand as the journalistic reference of the group and we'll focus just on politics and hard news, sharing much varied natural audience, no virals for Nacio. Then we'll migrate all non-political content from Nacio to Primera Buncat, which is a new platform brand that will cover everything except politics and hard news, and will showcase the content of all the other sites. 
obviously we'll create a new local hub for the for the local brands we'll get all them together with strong distributed leadership and a dedicated product and sales team and we'll do finally the same with the vertical brands uh, with a focus on creating b2c and b2b communities so we'll need a new organization we're building a new organization uh, to deliver the plan based on solid central services a very strong editorial leadership and a unified unified sorry uh, revenue management and fourth and last editorial transformation and this is the, this is the biggest part not only probably in our case but in, in every other one's case we think that we are producing caviar but our items is consume peanuts which we by the way sell them by an incredible amount daily so to reach the goals uh, and understand deeply our audiences we have to best serve their needs and we already have started uh, working with ft strategies uh, planning a complete North Star project, and also we'll start integrating the user needs model, uh, hopefully with, with uh, Dimitri Siskin help in some of our local newsrooms as you know, a way to start moving everything to the right direction. So uh, this plan has been going on for the last six months, and the goal is to launch the new brands on January 2024. By the way, thanks for the feedback, Nikita. And this is it from me. So as it's something that's going on and it's going to last, if you ask me how it's going, it's going well, I guess, but uh, I can assure you that it's been a hell of a year, as you can see, and CUNY has been the best part of it. So thank you. Thank you so much to everyone. Thank you so much, Mark. All right, just reminders here as we get going, um, and as you're just joining us, uh, please feel free to introduce yourself in the chat, uh, your name, where you're from, um, what you do. We're so excited to see such a, a wonderful international crowd with us today. Um, I am really excited to introduce our next guest speaker, um, our next member of our cohort, um, Feli. Uh, she is an Argentinian journalist and product thinker working at the intersection of media, technology, and sustainability. And she is currently the executive director of the News Product Alliance. Welcome, Feli. Thank you, Kyle, and thank you everyone for being here. Um, my name is Felicitas Carrique, and I am the Executive Director for the News Product Alliance. I am super excited to be here to present my capstone titled Unleashing the Power of Technology, a holistic framework for news media organizations to optimize their tech stack decisions. Yes, yet another ChatGPT generated title. <laughs> my mission is to empower communities through relevant journalism fueled by technology and innovation. However, I know making technology decisions in today's media landscape is tough. We often deal with uncertainty, low budgets, lack of solutions, and incomplete information. Effective communication adds complexity. I've been there myself, and I've worked and researched dozens of media organizations worldwide going through this process. During my research for this project, I discovered valuable insights. Newsrooms often lack specialized tech professionals, and reports show a low percentage of tech employees in newsrooms leading to, li to limited investment in technology. One of the challenges is also effectively communicating technical implications to non-technical team members and aligning diverse expectations. There is a disproportionate emphasis on short-term financial considerations during technology decision-making, which can also lead to suboptimal tool decisions with overlapping features and inefficient cost structures. With these challenges in mind, I created a framework-based question guide to help small to medium organizations optimize their tech stack decisions by embracing a strategic and holistic mindset based off product principles. The goal of the guide is to help media organizations think through decisions and analyze them from multiple perspectives without the need of having technical knowledge. To create a consistent language to communicate the decision and create alignment within key stakeholders. And lastly, to develop a solid and long-term arguments to support the decision. The goal, of sorry, <laughs> so let's, recap a bit and talk about how does the framework work. So by considering the four dimensions of mission, vision, goals, technology needs, and trade-offs, 
media processes and resources, and implementation planning, media professionals can adopt a holistic approach to technology decision-making. This comprehensive perspective emphasizes understanding the organization's needs, goals, and mission while considering trade-offs, challenges, and technology requirements. By addressing these aspects and proving guidelines for effective planning, organizations can leverage technology as a strategic enabler, fostering growth, innovation, and operational excellence in today's media landscape. The framework is structured as a question guide, and it goes through each dimension, helping media organizations factor in different considerations. The guide will take you through identifying a need or opportunity amongst your organization, analyzing it against business and overall organizational objectives, researching alternatives, developing arguments for selection, assessing risks and synergies related to your organization's workflows and media processes, and planning for implementation and evaluation. You can see an, uh, an example on the screen. You can use the guide by yourself, or you can use it to facilitate a discussion amongst team members from different areas. After each module, there are templates that could help you narrow down your considerations and clearly state the decisions made during the meeting or the workshop you went through with your team. This could create a shareable summary that provide a structured way to communicate and support those decisions within the organization. I am currently at testing and evaluation stage. I have already conducted minimum viable testing and incorporated feedback. However, we are looking to do a second round of testing to improve the framework. So if you want to get early access to the framework and test it for feedback, ping me, I will offer contact information in just a second. And after the testing period, the question guide will be freely available on the News Product Alliance's resource library. And best of all, it's licensed under Creative Commons, ensuring widespread access and usage. Thank you. Again, I am Felicitas Carrique. I am the Executive Director of the News Product Alliance, and this is my content information. I hope you will all be in touch. All right, thank you, Feli. Moving right along here, our next uh, presenter is Evie. Uh, Evie is the co-founder and program manager of the independent radio station Radio Boo in Upper Bavaria, Germany. Uh, Boo is a nonprofit supporting local culture, offering airplay to Bavarian artists among an eclectic mix of music. Um, I'm very excited for this next presentation because of music. Obviously, we all love music. So Evie, welcome. All right, thank you so much. Plus, it's always exciting when you're a radio person and you're allowed in front of a camera for once. So that's going to be fun. Hello, everyone. Yeah, so like I just said, I'm Ify and I'm running Radio Boo. It's a very, very small radio station about one hour south of Munich, Bavaria, really close to Austria, actually. Um, it's called Radio Boo, and my capstone is all about the ch ch changes that we're facing at this point. So stay tuned for more song references. And I already promised all my cohort, if anybody can sing all the hooks to me later, I will buy them a beer. All right, so before we get into the changes I'm about to tell you about, um, I want to tell you a little bit about how this all started. So we founded Radio Boo in 2015. We, that's my brother, who's a musician, me, a radio journalist, and a bunch of volunteers. Why did we do this? We were just very, very frustrated with the lack of uh, local music, local artists on the air. And so we said, we have to do something about this if nobody else is. So our goal was to create a very, very um, big variety in our programming. So 15 minutes on Boo could sound like Harry Styles, the Foo Fighters, your local band, and even Mozart, because we even have some classical tunes on the air. It's fun, <laughs> you should tune in. Yeah, if we love it, we play it. And also a big thing for us wa was to have volunteers do radio shows and to support kids and young people so we do a lot of school projects and give those people and those kids and uh, teenagers a voice too in our radio station. Yeah, so a few milestones on the slide. As you can see, we get nonprofits 
status in 2016, we did actually get a digital radio frequency after just starting online with um, in a significant area with about 1 million residents. And we uh, got the Bavarian Pop Culture Award, which was very exciting. And just this year, we signed a podcast deal that brings in some money, because that's the problem, little spoiler there. So what's going to happen next? You can hear, um, we grew, things fell into place. So this could be the slow clap, heroic end of the story, but it isn't, and this is why. All right, stop in the name of who song in there. So what is happening? Well, we can't live of love, passion, and fame alone. We all would love to, but we just can't, right? So with Boo, the problem is we're working on too many sites because at some point we just took every monetizing opportunity we had because we had to, but now we're all over the place and we still have too little resources to do our work the way we would want it to do. So we can't live up to our own expectations, let alone the expectations everybody else has in us. And the workload is a lot. And the mental load at this point is really at its limit as well. Uh, and also we have to say that there was no massive listener explosion. I love Pankaj's one is also an audience, but still uh, right now it doesn't justify going on at this um, pace. Okay, so I detected a performance and an opportunity gap. Well, two big ones. Uh, the main performance gap is we can't acquire enough money to make our ends meet. Simple as that. And the opportunity gap is we're not really serving the listen on demand world at this point as we would love to and should, but we just don't have the resources to do so. So ch -ch changes are in place. And the big strategic challenge we are facing is, can we transform the brand Radio Boo we built into another more sustainable business model? So we did a lot of math. Uh, basically, we did a lot of post-its <laughs> and looked at everything that's happening. And we came to a very sad and radical solution, but also a brave one, I think. And that is, we're going to have to quit the 24-hour programming and just move to streaming and social media and try to still keep our idea going in another more sustainable way. So we looked at pains and gains, as we all do in life sometimes. It's always good to make lists, I guess. So the main pains are, of course, we're giving up the frequency we worked very hard for. We're losing some of the old school radio audience on the way. And we're not sure if our volunteers can be uh, involved in the same amount as they are now. But we have a lot of gains as well. Financial benefits, of course. Uh, immense amount of pressure will be lifted when we don't have a 24-7 product anymore. Uh, we can focus on modern user needs. And we can produce less but better content. Plus, pre-production will be much easier, and we can finally go on laptop-free vacations. Has been a while. All right, so this is the path. Uh, the first steps are already happening. I'm talking to all the st stakeholders at this point, looking at our options. We did this. Uh, we did sign this really well-paid podcast deal, so we have a basic revenue stream insured during this transitional period. But we're also looking into still having the radio component in there. I love radio. I'm old school. <laughs> and so curating playlists, releasing podcasts, talking music on social media is nice. But I really want to have some radio thing going. So we're really exploring some talk and music formats on Spotify or other streaming services to keep this spirit going. So this is the move that's going to happen. We're going to let go of the frequency and the web radio and the regular volunteers radio shows, but we're going to keep a bunch of stuff. We're going to keep the nonprofit status. We hopefully we can keep the volunteers involved in some way. We're going to keep the youth radio and some of the paid content and just move it to streaming. And we keep the music related social media content. And what's new, well, the podcast that brings money in is new. Uh, we're going to do those monthly shows, like talk and music formats. And we're going to have a newsletter to keep listeners updated on what we're doing when we put up new playlists and stuff. My dream is, Radio Girl Can Dream, to have a music-related, super successful podcast at some point. All right, I'll be missing Boo. To those who want a beer later, it's another one. So the rollout has to happen. I don't want this to be a painful slow roll for everyone. We have one more year to go until we pull the plug. So I decided to make this a year long celebration of everything we achieved and of this brave decision that was very hard to make. So we want to celebrate and I want to be the agent of change with a positive attitude and support everybody as we go along. Um, when it's all said and done, we will always be able to tell our kids how we once ran this badass radio station. And Boo will live on, just not the same as it was. Thank you very much. Have a wonderful day, everybody. <laughs> Thank you so much, Evie. 
We're gonna let the good times roll, keep going here with our next presenter, Veronica. Before I pass it off to her, just remember, um, please make sure if you're saying things in the chat that you are saying them to everyone, you can make that setting switch there in the chat for you and not just the host and panelists. We want everyone to see the amazing comments that you're saying. Um, please continue to ask questions uh, and engage in the chat. We really love to see it here. I'm really excited to uh, introduce Veronica. Um, Veronica is a Swiss American journalist and editor working as head of audience at SWI, the 10 language international service of the Swiss Broadcasting Corporation. So welcome, Veronica. All right. Hi, everybody, and um, hope you're having a good morning or afternoon, wherever you happen to be listening from in the world today. Um, today, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, how we're meeting some challenges related to our 10 language audience um, and uh, a playbook that I wrote um, to try to get to the bottom of that. So uh, first, a little bit about our legacy. This is a shortwave radio. Um, we were founded in 1935 as Swiss Radio International. Um, and a shortwave radio service that broadcast in many languages around the world. These days, we're a multimedia 10 language platform. Um, we cover topics like multinational companies operating in Switzerland, international organizations in Geneva, the banking and fintech scene, um, among many others. And um, our challenge in 2023 is really that our users and our potential users are all over the world. So we have a small loyal user base um, especially in certain languages, but most of our audience is really new to us every single day. So how do we know that we've met their needs in this context? How do we measure public value? How do we get away from um, having people have their shortwave radios tuned uh, to us and rather put out our antennas and try to understand um, what they need from our service? So all of this led me to the user needs model. Many of you may be familiar with this. It's really adding a component to our journalism um, that puts the user at the center. So does the person want to know something, understand something, feel something, do something? Um, and so I wrote a playbook um, for my capstone project that really contains the specifics of how we can implement um, this model at our organization, but also a broader audience listening strategy. So I started out with uh, looking at our existing user research. So what are the needs of our user base? And I started by looking at the so-called Swiss abroad audience. These are people that we serve. They're Swiss citizens living outside the country. There are 800,000 of them. They can vote for life. And they're maybe a more tangible part of our audience that we did a big study on last year. And so these are some of the thoughts that they shared with us. And from these thoughts, very clear needs emerged. Connect me, give me perspective, help me form a decision. Um, then I had a look at our 10 language research um, with inputs from users reading in Japanese and Arabic and many of our other languages. And actually that tracked, it was very, there were very similar needs that emerged. And in the end, we came up with six. Um, and these are very similar to what you might see at the BBC, for example, or other organizations. But as part of the playbook, I really uh, drilled down and tried to give journalists an orientation point for our coverage and how they would apply these needs. And that's something that um, our team will keep working with them on as we hopefully implement this in the coming months. So essentially every story that, that we produce needs to have um, the combination of topic, user need, and format. So this might be something like a story on avalanche research. Um, we want to inspire people with it because it helps save lives. And so the need would be inspire me. And the format might be a video showing someone who has been helped or rescued by this technology. Um, and so this really helps language departments make more informed choices when they're deciding what content to adapt because they might have um, a menu that we've produced of content per day, they can choose kind of at, le at most three things that they might um, adapt in their language. This gives um, a much better orientation point around what is being overproduced, underproduced, what resonates with their audience in terms of needs. And then we also have beats or verticals that we cover um, across the organization. So we're really organized in a matrix. And uh, when we're applying to the beats, this is where it gets really interesting. At the intersection of language and, and beat, rather, we can find communities for which we can define user needs even further, find new ones, um, drill down. And one example might be the, the community around Geneva that's working there and international organizations. They're primarily working in English and French. So we have opportunities to learn more about them through existing tools. Also, we've created an engagement desk at our organization made up of journalists who um, work across the organization thinking about these things. They are a key part of this process. And I developed a cheat sheet um, for uh, journalists and even marketing folks who go out and talk to 
um, users at our events to try to really centralize the feedback we're getting and bring it back to the beats and back to the user needs. But of course, we need to have a foundation in data to move forward. So one of the things about uh, the user needs model is that the tagging of content, back tagging of content to get, to get this foundation can be quite tedious. So we tried it out using GPT-4. Um, we had the AI take on the role of a user needs expert and evaluate this key format of ours, which is very context heavy and um, orients the reader about a, an international topic related to Switzerland. And the AI gave reasoning for each story, um, which is very useful. And we did find that this, um, this format had an overproduction of the so-called update me need. It's not meant to be news, and yet there were several stories in there that really weren't giving the context that we had hoped for. So we're in the process of kind of manually confirming the results, and uh, so far so good, and we're hoping we can use this method to really get a basis in data more quickly and more efficiently. And then, of course, we have to think about how to make it stick in the newsroom. And this is this is really where the change element comes in. So it's about applying our learning, starting small, not only listening to the audience, of course, but also the people in the newsroom. How is this landing, piloting projects, sharing successes um, where they happen, and um, really also taking care to adjust and adapt the model to meet new and different user needs as they emerge. So that's what I have for you today. And if you're interested in getting a copy of the playbook or learning more, please reach out to me and thank you so much. Thank you so much, Veronica. All righty. Up next, we have Jin. Uh, Jin is a Chinese journalist who has spent the past 10 years in international nonprofit journalism. Currently, she's serving as Chief of Staff and Operations at the Center for Public Integrity. I mean, they are also the VP of Finance at the Asian American Journalists Association. Very excited to have Jin with us. After a crazy travel, we're excited to have her here in person. Okay, welcome, Jin. Thank you, everyone. I am super excited to join you today. Good morning. Um, my capstone project, to Simplify Chinese, focuses on a very urgent issue which is the lack of independent Chinese voices that are serving the global Chinese community. And through the case studies, I drew a pathway that could lead to drastic changes. So Chinese journalism could fight for its future despite unprecedented challenges from censorship to racism to geopolitical tensions. Tens of millions of Chinese live outside of the country. Many of them still heavily rely on Chinese language news. Unfortunately, this is also a space that is dominated by Chinese government fueled propaganda, disinformation, and misinformation. Lack of reliable, independent voices created a void and really allowed a playbook with alternative facts to dominate this space. Our communities are divided based on the language of news they consume. It's becoming a bigger issue than just a China problem. It is challenging local and global politics by day. For example, studies already show that false information on WeChat is impacting local elections in Australia. On the other hand, the urgency could not be greater. Hong Kong is no longer a press freedom beacon in Asia, and inside of the Great Firewall, President Xi is pursuing a crusade against the journalism. We are witnessing a wave of independence independent voices from journalists to authors to artists fleeing China. And the government would not stop physically and mentally harassing those journalists and their families. It is called long-armed censorship. Many seasoned reporters and editors who have inspired me to become a journalist now are self-exiled and are becoming refugees. But when they finally reach the world of freedom, the harsh fact is that there is still no clear path for them to pursuing journalism and make a living. We are facing the risk to lose the already not really existing bench with a depth of, of journalism talents in Chinese. I could not help but ask what people like me would do. Many of us have found our ways in English journalism over the years. Can we together create a safety net for these new, newcomers? How can we together serve the communities outside of China? And is it still possible for us to use journalism and make an impact inside of the Great Firewall? 
In this capstone project, I took a closer look at two organizations. One is an award-winning digital newsroom. Another is a publishing platform that utilizes blockchain technology to uh, support creators and cr uh, cultivate an online community. I draw conclusions to these facts. One is that we need to cultivate a new audience behavior that will sustain the business of journalism. Second, we need to collectively commit in safety and the well-beings of those reporters. Third, we need to, need to have a society-wide approach to deliver facts. We cannot wait for the audience to come to us. And the most important one is we must learn and demonstrate how to do journalism that is truly serving the Chinese audience all around the globe. What's next for us? Due to safety reasons, obviously, I cannot share my detailed learnings, those numbers in my findings. Or um, I, nor can I actually publish my 20 page reporting on the internet. Um, so, but I want to use this opportunity to share that we do have a strategic path and it is not going to be an easy one. It will require more than innovation, leadership, and courage. Let's start with, we need resources and use the limited resources smartly. I am fundraising for, to make a few things happen. For example, including this newsroom in my case study that they are investing in building technology and systems that will allow them to um, support the next level of membership growth. Over the next few years, they will be working on delivering their revenue streams um, in more diversified ways. We simply could not risk having more than uh, 1 billion people on this planet with no reliable access to facts. I am leaving my email on the screen and get in touch if you want to learn more and help. Happy to share with you in small group settings or one-on-one -on -one with my findings. At the end, I want to pay respect to every Chinese independent voices inside and outside of the Great Firewall. You, your courage, and your resilience inspire me. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jen. Up next, we have Mark. Mark is known for his participative and positive leadership. Uh, Mark always looks for simple but creative solutions to complex problems, something that I think he shares with the rest of our cohort as well, uh, and tries to turn challenges and unexpected events into opportunities. I'll let Mark introduce himself some more. So welcome to the stage, Mark. Good morning, everyone. <laughs> So I'm Marc Gendron, Principal Director of Digital Growth for Les Coop de l'Information. If you haven't figured out yet, I'm uh, French speaking. I come from Quebec, Canada. Uh, well, welcome to my capstone project presentation, which is called the Digital Toolbox, or how to kickstart a change in culture without saying that culture needs to change. Our news group has come a long way. At the end of summer 2019, our previous owner was a couple of thousand dollars close to bankruptcy. Our employees and communities got together to invest in what was seen as the only property model that could allow for the survival, collective ownership. That's how Les Coop de l'Information were born. But the market reality that brought us close to bankruptcy did not magically disappear when we became the first employee-owned local news group in Canada. It became clear that one of our only track to financial stability would be the launch of digital subscriptions. Our business plan included the launch of a paywall in the first 18 months and the reduction of the number of print editions. But COVID-19 forced us to act much faster than that. In March, 2020, we suspended the weekdays print edition and launched the digital subscription project. Today, even though we are way ahead of our provisions, our subscription growth rate is still insufficient to allow us to reach complete sustainability before the end of our print editions. To accelerate growth, we must adopt a truly digital culture. The challenge is that most of our journalists have learned to do their craft in a print first, if not print only fashion. Our workflows are process driven and print oriented. Our newspapers are a bundle of contents, some great, some not. With digital comes the revolution of measure. Many journalists were shocked when they realized that what they thought was of the utmost public interest failed to meet the interest of the public. 
Some believe that every subscriber read their piece, arguing that they are not writing to get clicks and that they know what the reader wants. We also try to replicate in digital the feeling of print, mostly to serve as a bridge between the ink and paper experience to the pixel and screen one. All of that for a consequence that some of our journalists never develop the necessary digital skills and reflexes. Our most loyal readers never were exposed to a truly digital experience. They were having a print one on a screen. And now most of our new digital subscribers are in the same age group as our print subscribers. Over the past year, we implemented a new CMS, and we saw this as an occasion to adopt an audience-driven, data-informed, digital-first mindset. But reality caught up with us. Taming our new cooperative model and technical training sidelined the necessary conversation about how we should be doing our job in the digital age. We also announced the end of our print editions for this December, and that doing so, about a third of our staff would have to leave. So let's say that the conditions were not met to address the hot topic of cultural change. But that wasn't enough to stop me. I was convinced that in order to aspire for perennity, we had to let go of volume in favor of value, that we had to serve a plurality of audiences composing a network of communities, that we could not serve them bland, one size fits all content, expecting that it would convince them to subscribe. An easy task, isn't it? <laughs> so, so I worked on what at first was supposed to be a playbook, but that became more and more of a toolbox because journalists do not like to be told what to do. These tools all serve the same purpose, find ways to better serve our communities. And we knew with which cohort of users we could test these tools, those aged between 34 and 44, who represent the largest chunk of our free users. Here is the list of these tools. The Persona Project, a user survey and a focus group that allowed us to define the needs and threats of the audience we want to develop. The User Needs Chart, our own adaptation of the list of users' needs that we have to satisfy to make our contents useful and essential to the lives of our readers. The 5 W's of Targeted Audience, a list of questions that journalists have to ask themselves in order to make sure that they know who they're working for, what to deliver them, where and when they should engage with them, and why readers should care about their story. The content creation checklist, a list of things to think about and execute from the ideation phase to days after content delivery. And finally, the digital resources microsite, an internal website where tutorials, good practices, and tools are made available. This toolbox now serves as the basis of our fully digital content strategy. A majority of journalists were hyped by the proposed vision and are eager to use these new tools. For some of them though, it is still hard to accept that we don't cover anything, everything like we used to do, and that deciding to serve younger audiences might come to the expense of losing older ones. But it's a necessary part of our evolution because we know that trying to please everyone could lead us to please no one. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mark. Uh, we're up next before uh, I introduce Rodney here. Just a reminder, keep the chat going. Our part lovely participants are in the chat. They can answer any questions that you have. If you want to get in touch with them to talk more about their projects, um, feel free to do that. Um, and uh, also just uh, feel free to introduce yourself if you're just joining us now. Um, and remember to uh, that little blue box at the button lets you uh, switch to, so you can chat with everyone and not just the hosts and, uh, and panelists here. Up next, Rodney. Rodney is a Senior Director of Strategy and Innovation at the Atlanta Journal-Constitution. Uh, he serves on the boards of the Online News Association and the current a Watchdog Newsroom covering the Georgia Coast. Great to have you here, Rodney. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Hi there, I'm Rodney Gibbs, like uh, I said, with Atlanta Journal Constitution. So we've heard a lot of big ideas and thought about a lot of big ideas this last year about innovation. And we often swing for the fences trying to create new things and grow audience and revenue. But also I think innovation is about looking at the kind of maybe not so shiny objects and the 
old ideas that need improving and fixing. I kind of geek out on process a lot when I think about this. What are ways that we can do something that will improve the process and the culture, particularly when it has such profound effects on our business? Uh, I started a job uh, during the pandemic, and you know, I didn't go to a newsroom that looked like this. I was working from home. And now that we're out of the pandemic, you know, often we don't even see newsrooms like this anymore. It looks a little more like this. And so it got me thinking about if we're really going to start people off right, we need to really stop making onboarding suck so much because it's really not a great experience. And it has such an impact on how we make employees join the team and feel included and set them off on the right foot for going forward. So in short, I don't want onboarding to feel like this. I want onboarding to feel like this. <laughs> so the bar is fairly low when you look at how companies do this. Uh, a third of companies don't even offer onboarding whatsoever. We know that it takes companies, uh, takes employees 12 months to get up to speed. So if we onboard better, we could cut that down and get people up to speed much faster. And only 12% of employees surveyed whose company offers onboarding says their company does it well. So, hey, journalists, like the bar is pretty low. We can do a lot better than that. So what I did with my capstone is I interviewed a lot of companies. I looked at good and bad practices. I stole all the good ones uh, and put them into an onboarding guide that we can use and iterate on together to make the process better. So I'm not going to go through the whole thing, but I'm going to highlight five things that you should think about in your onboarding journey. One is start early. You know, the first day is a big, important day, but you need to back up before that and have everything prepared from the technology to the schedules to the passwords. There's nothing worse than an employee coming on the first day and no one's ready for him. Uh, I've had that experience myself and it doesn't feel good. The second is to personalize it. You know, a senior person starting and a junior person starting, person on team A or team B have very different needs and experiences. So give them a schedule that's tailored to them. Give them cheat sheets about who they're gonna work with, Slack channels they should join, documents they should be familiar with. It should be personalized to each person. Here's an example of something we used recently for a new employee starting. We gave her a schedule two weeks in advance, or sorry, her first two weeks, so she knew what was coming tried to put it in manageable bites, and each day outlined things that she should be doing or thinking about so that over the first two weeks, she wasn't overwhelmed, but she got into the flow pretty regularly. Uh, fourth one is adopt a user manual. Several progressive newsrooms are already doing this. This is basically Cliff's Notes for your coworkers. It's a short document that people fill out so when they start, they can see what makes their boss tick, what makes their colleagues, gives them pet peeves, what you know how they run meetings, and it's just a great way to accelerate that learning curve that might take weeks or months otherwise. Uh, here's an example from one. You can see the top line there. It says, start with headlines. I prefer bullets to prose. So this person is telling her new hire that, you know, keep it crisp, keep to the headlines, save the long, windy stuff for later. Uh, and the next one is assign a buddy. Everyone likes a buddy, but particularly I found a lot of newsrooms assign a buddy who's not even on their team. It's someone who's adjacent or somewhere else in the newsroom. And this is someone that, you know, when you're new and you're not sure what this jargon means or how to log in the CMS or who is that person that's emailing me that seems to want stuff from me, I'm not sure who it is. The buddy is someone they can lean on and do that. And the smart thing, too, is a lot of newsrooms make these time bounds. So the buddy is there for 60 or 90 days. So it's not a permanent relationship. But then the buddy often will buddy multiple people in a year. Uh, and the last thing is surprise and delight. Uh, newsrooms are doing really fun stuff to make this a much better experience. Lion is a great organization. It's completely remote. They ask employees before they start, what's their favorite sweet treat? And so the day they start, they get this delivery uh, from a, a company on their doorstep with their favorite cookie or, or candy. AL.com, a great organization in Alabama, offers, uh, asks employees to do employee bingo. This is a portion of the card where employees go through when they start and they have to fill out the bingo card and complete it to, to win a little spiff of some sort. So all these things go into an onboarding guide. I found that you, know, you can create the guide and then iterate it over time so you're not trying to reinvent the wheel, but it improves as it goes. So I hope that uh, everyone will in embrace better onboarding because it perpetuates uh, employees really joining and feeling included, which helps the newsroom overall. But thank you very much, Rodney Gibbs. Thank you so much, Rodney. Um, we are, I definitely know, I speak uh, for myself, but also a lot of people on the chat here that definitely want that onboarding guide. So definitely uh, very excited uh, to see that project. 
Up next, uh, we have Pear, and um, I am going to let Pear introduce himself. Um, I'm actually going to stop sharing my screen right now because uh, he has props. Uh, there's a teaser for you here. So I'm going to pass it over to Pear uh, to get us started with our next presentation. Thank you so much. I do have props. I'm Per Grantvist. I'm the founder of Bobby Viet. We do explanatory journalism in Sweden. And I brought with me the props, which is this cassette. On this cassette, you'll find 10, the 10 songs that were on the Billboard top hits in 1979. But only two of them remain sort of in published consciousness. And that is YMCA by the village people. And tellingly, I will survive with Gloria Gaynor. You can put these on at any party, at any event, on any radio station, and people will always love it because they always dance to it. These are songs people keep getting back into again and again and again. That's what we call them, evergreen songs. And across the media and entertainment industry, you'll find an evergreen concept everywhere. You can find it in books. It's one of the most best-selling authors of all times. You'll find it in musicals. You can find it in movies. The Rocky here. You can find it in TV. I have Seinfeld. But you don't find it said much in the news industry. And that's something I've been thinking about a lot, trying to understand why that is. Because the audience love evergreen. So again and again and again in audience interviews and the audience service, they tell us, we want the concept. We want the, the context, the explanations, the, the news behind the news, so to help us explain, understand what's happening in, in the world every day. But still, news media are doubling down and delivering more breaking news or more concept or the bundle of things together with even more news, even though people don't want it. So why did most efforts to create evergreen content fail so badly? I found three interlying and interrelated factors I'll share with you. The first of all is distribution problem. When Vox started doing explanatory journalism in 2014, they quickly ran into problem when they found out that it wasn't distributing as well on social. It's not a problem just for Vox. Everyone has have sort of felt this today and before. All of the news industry, evergreen content has always been falling short of competing with the attention and the, the traction of news content is getting. So naturally, you put more input, more effort into doing stuff that do share on social, like breaking. The second is a culture problem. Many reports are obsessed with news, and they like to do their beat, like to be where things are happening, and they like to be there out there. What you don't want to do is sit behind a desk and explain long, boring things. It's too boring, it's too basic, and it's not even breaking, they feel. The third is an analytics problem. Because when you analyze the problems, when you analyze what the stuff that actually is working, we didn't realize that when we rolled out analytics, they were actually biased towards breaking news. As a reporter, you would get your top news every day or every week, perhaps. And top five, this is maybe 10,000 views or 20,000 views, something in that rate, let's say. And then you had the breaking at uh, the um, evergreen stories at the very end of that list, maybe 2,000 views a week. Next week, another top five, and, and, and the evergreen story is still at the bottom at, two, at 2K. But if you would change the way you look at it and look at it from a month or a year, and nobody does this, by the way, then you would see that the Evergreen story actually is getting 100,000 views a year, where the weekly hits are just weekly hits. They rarely get more than 20,000 in this example. In short, analytics do not reflect the full lifetime value of the Evergreen content. By evaluating performance on a single report on a weekly basis, we might never see the best performing article of the year. And chances are that that's actually an Evergreen story. Chances are pretty big, actually. So if you then use analytics to evaluate performances on your site, it seems like evergreen stories are always underperforming. And then if you have a culture that do not want to do evergreen stories, they will use the weak analytics as their reasoning for not doing anything more, because it doesn't seem like they're traveling very well. And so we end up in this vicious cycle where news media, the preventing news media from getting users what they actually want. So how should you solve this? Well, I, I argue you quit the media circus and enter a more educational mindset. Do things with the explicit purpose of helping people increase the understanding of the world. This realization helped me to go and pivot from a news media organization to turn it into an educational company. We do, don't do news, we try to be newsful instead. We publish rich explanations on our own platforms and use other platforms in order to help people discover it and to be more curious and to find us online. And that is basically the recipe, how we got 700,000, an audience of 700,000 in a country of 10 million. Because as I told you, people love evergreen stories. You just have to give it to them. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pear. 
All righty, we are moving on to our next presenter here. Pretty sure we are up and running. Perfect. We uh, next have Sipo. Uh, Sipo is a co-founder and editorial director of The Continent, a weekly African newspaper. So welcome, Sipo. Thank you, Kyle. So this is a really bad selfie of myself, which is very flattering. I am the editorial director and co-founder of The Continent. I help run the newspaper and Shout out to all the Africans in the room. I know it's evening time, so thank you for being here. The, Af the content is a weekly African newspaper. Now this is Africa as you'll normally see her. This is the picture we're used to, but this is the real size of Africa. She's huge and she's home to one in five of all human beings. But our story gets told by news agencies, by television, newspapers, online websites that aren't African. They're not from the continent. So three years ago, we created the continent. It's a weekly newspaper taking from the best parts of print newspapers and using the 21st century technology to distribute it to people. The PDF is about 30 pages and we'll send it to you wherever you are. And you can read it on whatever device you wanna read it on. It's designed for small screens, so there are no more than 300 words on a page. This means stories have to be really well edited and written. Our 20,000 subscribers are mostly on WhatsApp, Signal, Telegram, and email. And those subscribers are in 140 countries. Two thirds are in Africa. And people of all ages read us. And none of this would have been possible without this team. Majority woman, majority black. A year ago, we decided that we had the proof of concept. We had this beautiful newspaper that we love so much and that our audience loves. We now needed to build structures so that it could exist now and then thrive well into the future. Part of this involved me coming to CUNY to do this course with this rather incredible cohort of people that you're hearing from. And using our classes as a hook, our newspaper team started writing down those big questions. Why do we exist? And then solving those questions. And the first one was this, what's our mission? So we wanna be the most important African publication for people anywhere in the world. We broke this down into three main parts. Number one, far too many newsrooms are toxic places to work and great journalists aren't able to earn a living by being journalists. So we wanna be the best employer in journalism in Africa. Number two, and going back to how Africa is reported, we want to do it better. We want to create story spaces for stories about Africa. And we want to create spaces for African perspectives about the world. And then number three, we want to get that journalism to our community, wherever they are. Taking that mission and vision, we then started looking at the strategy of how we get that done, the nuts and bolts of it. I won't go into the details of that, but the big thing was an organogram. So we looked at what we want to look like in 2026 to do great journalism. This would mean maybe doubling or tri tripling the size of the newsroom, which means getting a lot of roles, especially in the business side of journalism, where we don't know people. So the organogram was really helpful in making us panic about all the roles we have to find and how to find those people, and then panic even more about all the money we have to raise to hire those people. So we haven't slept a lot in the last few months, <laughs> but one very tangible thing we're doing in the next few weeks is registering a nonprofit that'll house our journalism. Its board, who we want to be all women, will be the curators of that mission vision. They'll help the content grow well into the future. Now, a lot of this is thanks to the sharing of people in this course, and then people in journalism and all other walks of life. We wouldn't be here without it. And if you're one of those people, thank you. If you want to join us on this journey, take a screenshot of this or Google us, the continent, then send us a message and we'll do the rest. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sipo. 
Uh, next, uh, we are more than halfway through our presentations right now. And so we posted here in the, the chat uh, the um, amazing people that are coming up next. Uh, so stay tuned for their wonderful presentations. Up next, we have Rebecca Klein, uh, who is publisher of New York Focus, New York's only statewide nonprofit newsroom. Uh, New York Focus in investigates how pay, uh, power works in the Empire State and how that trickles down uh, to impact to local communities. Uh, she previously worked as a reporter and editor. Welcome, Rebecca. Hello, it's so good to see everyone in the chat. Um, I'm Rebecca Klein, I'm the publisher of New York Focus, and I did my project on how news organizations can design better processes for hiring candidates. Um, as I said, I'm the publisher of New York Focus. We're New York's only statewide nonprofit newsroom. We cover what happens in Albany and the state legislature and what that means for communities all over New York State. So I wanted to focus on this topic, obviously, like all journalists, I've been part of a range of job application experiences, some good, some not so good. They've all impacted how I feel about the organization. And also my organization, New York Focus, we are undergoing a significant growth period. So we're gonna be doing a lot of hiring. And I wanna design a process that not only helps us get the best candidate possible, but also works for the applicants so that we can have something that is fair, that is equitable, that is kind, that is generous, and that sets people up for success. So to do this, I interviewed journalists uh, who are at different, different points in their careers, some early career, some late career, who've been part of a range of processes. And I divided my project into three chapters to mimic the job application process. So the first chapter is recruitment and applying. The second chapter is edit tests and interviews. And the third chapter are offers and negotiations. So chapter one, recruitment and applications. Um, it's probably not surprising that the people I interviewed tended to have better experiences when they were recruited for roles. Um, they tended to be recruited by professional recruiters though, which is not always possible for small organizations. In particular, it's not possible for my organization. So I talked to a lot of folks and thought a lot about how we could make recruiting a permanent part of our organization. That'd be an ongoing process and that we'd be constantly sourcing for candidates. And one way to do this would be to start a Google form in our organization to get ideas from people within our newsroom um, and to make sure that we're looking outside of management's individual networks. Um, another idea is to create a hiring hotline. So what that means is when we post the position, opening up a hotline that allows us to put aside five to 10 minute blocks with applicants or potential applicants before they even start the process to answer their questions and to give them transparency into the organization. So we're just setting them up for success and whether or not they know it's even a good idea for them to apply for this position. So my takeaways for chapter one is that recruitment should never be should be a never ending process and that uh, we should do what we can to have hiring office hours if we have the capacity. Uh, chapter two, interviews and edit tests. Across the board, everyone I spoke to said that they found it really helpful when at the onset of a process, the person in charge said, this is what the process is going to look like. You're going to talk to these people, and then if you make it to the next round, we're going to ask for this, and then if you make it to the next round, we're going to ask for this. It gave people a lot more transparency into the process and let them know whether or not they were being successful and what they would need to do to be successful. My takeaways for chapter two is that transparency makes a huge difference for candidates, uh, that you should always pay for candidates' labor when they're doing edit tests. Um, to ask really explicitly about candidate schedules, I spoke to someone who was working in retail while they were in between jobs, and uh, organizations kept, kept scheduling interviews on different parts uh, of the week. And so instead of being able to take one day off, they had to take multiple days off, which obviously cut into their income, and to ask interviewees consistent questions to protect against bias. Uh, chapter three, offers and negotiations. So in New York, we're now required to post salary ranges, um, but I think there's a lot of benefits all over, not just for the applicants, but also for the organizations in terms of narrowing what type of experience they're looking for and what level of experience they're looking for. And also to provide feedback as best as you can if you have capacity to applicants. Um, the most the, someone told me the thing to most aggressively avoid is to just never hearing from you. That is the most insulting thing. The more people feel like they have the opportunity to ask questions, that's always powerful. So chapter three takeaways is that salary transparency is good for business and that feedback always feels better. And then in conclusion, the most important thing is that the person you hire, the onboarding process starts when they see that job posting. Consistency, clarity, and involvement and buy-in of the staff is really important while also designing a process that doesn't break your capacity. And that's it for me. Thank you so much, Rebecca. Up next, we have Laura. 
Uh, she is the subscriber products editor at the Chronicle of Higher Education in Washington, D.C. And after more than a decade as a reporter, she now works in news product, helping to produce journalism that meets the needs of the people we serve. Welcome, Laura. Good morning. Hi, everyone. My name is Laura Kranz, and I'm the subscriber products editor at the Chronicle of Higher Education in Washington, D.C. For my capstone, I asked the question, what are the essential skills that the next generation of media leaders will need in order to move our industry towards a more sustainable future? I asked this question because it feels like we're at the beginning of a new era. On the one hand, our industry still faces so much uncertainty around our business model. But just like we've seen today, there's an incredible amount of innovation happening inside most media organizations. Over the past year in this program, we've had the privilege of seeing just how many journalists are out there bringing us closer to the people that we serve, thanks to smarter audience research, more innovative products, more interesting delivery models, and workplaces that are more inclusive and diverse. But the problem is that often these changes come from the bottom up, by people who devote their personal time and energy to finding a new way of doing journalism. And what happens is that when they leave, these changes fall apart. So that's why it felt really important in this moment to consider who we need from our leaders. Because if we want these changes to stick and if we want them to be codified into a new way of doing journalism, then we need people at the very top of our organizations who are champions of change. So I put this question to 26 media experts and here are the top five skills that evolve from those interviews. I hope these concepts will guide those who hire and develop leaders and also those who aspire to become them. They're also skills that current leaders can and should cultivate. First, product thinking. We need leaders who can unite the business and editorial sides of our organizations by centering the communities that we serve. In the past, journalism has been extremely siloed, but product thinkers are the ones who can unite people across departments around a shared vision. As one expert said, it's somebody who thinks about money and impact at the same time. Next, we need leaders who understand how to strategize. This means coming up with a clear course of action, saying no to alternatives, and backing that up with thoughtful audience research. Research means having real conversations with the people that we serve to understand their wants and needs. Third, we need leaders with an entrepreneurial mindset. In the past, there was somewhat of a formula for how to produce the news, but today there is no longer any formula. And as one expert said, we need leaders who are excited by chaos. Now these first three skills are very businessy and that's for a reason. Historically, journalism has not done a very good job of educating our leaders in the way that other industries have, and this needs to change. But while it's important to acknowledge that journalism is a business, it's also a business with a very important mission. And that's why the four skills that the experts describe is what I'm calling mission evangelism. We need leaders with a public service mindset who care deeply about the reasons why we do this work and who can articulate that in a way that earns the trust of both their employees and the communities they serve. And last, and I think this is the most important, we need leaders who consider themselves stewards not only of their organizations, but of their people. In the past, we've lost too many uh, really talented folks to workplaces that are not diverse, not inclusive. They don't invest in people's careers or promote a healthy work-life balance. And so what we need instead are leaders who are generous, who are not afraid to disrupt legacy workplace culture and who teach their employees their worth. Now this picture of a leader is completely different than the ones that I saw in the newsrooms where I started my career. But now in my bridge role at the Chronicle, I see people with these skills across many departments. The thing is, they often don't have legacy job titles. Instead, they might work in audience, data analytics, social media, product engineering, design, or they might come from outside the organization altogether. What the experts I spoke with said though, and what's really important, is that we recognize the incredible value that these skills offer, that we enable these people, we promote them, and we help them become the next generation of leaders. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Laura. All right, up next we have Jeka. Uh, Jeka is the head of Office of Eurovision News and a news exchange for Southeast Europe. Um, and she's based in Sarajevo, Bosnia and Herzegovina. Welcome, Jeka. Um, thank you, Kyle. Thank you very much. It is really great privilege for me to be here with you today to talk to you and tell you about all the exciting stuff that I actually learned during the last year. But if I would need to single out one thing, that would be the importance of the audience for today's media organizations. That is the reason why uh, I structure my capstone around the goal of putting the audience in the center of public service media newsrooms. And my capstone is actually the roadmap document that my organization, Coordination Office of the Network of 11 National Public Service Media Organization in Southeast Europe, will use to work with the news management in these organizations to help them to achieve this goal, but also to help us to understand better our regional audience. Just a couple of words to explain you the media environment in which we operate. Um, European public service media have very particular relationship with their audience. They are established by the states in which they operate, they are regulated by the public service media laws, and they are funded directly from their audience. That's why it's essential for them to keep their audience loyal. They have to know more about their audience in order to reflect the diversity in their content, and they have to engage with their audience more in order to understand their needs and, and preferences and to make their content relevant. The roadmap that I structure have, has three, five different steps, and in the center of the roadmap is the most crucial step, introduction of the new newsroom position of the audience editors, something that still doesn't exist in most of the public service media organizations I work with. The first two steps, uh, the analysis and identification of the digital news platforms and products, as well as online digital news strategies and goals and metrics used to measure their success, is something that have to be done by the public service media organization by themselves. The remaining two steps, the training for the newly appointed audience editors and the networking, possible regional networking of audience editors is something that my organization plan to do. So as I said, the first step would be analysis and identification of the digital news uh, platforms and products. I must underline that also public service media in Europe and Southeast Europe also, uh, they pr produce different type of content and they focus still mostly on the, their broadcasting channels, television and radio. I focused here on digital news output because I truly believe that digital is the future of public service media in Europe. So this is the overview of the existing platforms and products that are uh, used by the European public service media based on the data from last year. As you can see, they, they are still focused more on their website on mobile application and social media platforms, mostly Facebook and YouTube, and I'm a bit slower with other digital products like podcasts, messaging apps, and newsletters. Based on the survey that I made with six public broadcasting uh, media organizations from Southeast Europe, the region in which I operate, I found out that they do have already some kind of online strategies and goals, but they are quite general, general like reaching general audience or more specific reaching younger audience. They do follow some metrics. They're not very well aligned with their goal and strategy still. But most importantly, only one out of six public service media organizations that I've talked to have one person dedicated to actually interpret audience needs in the newsrooms. That is why I define the key requirements, the profile, the tasks of the audience editors in public service media. They should be the one to interpret the needs of the audience in the newsroom, to interpret the metrics, to pass them to their colleagues in the newsroom, both in digital and also in TV and radio, and to actually transform them into the meaningful editorial decisions. What is particular for public service media is that focus is not on converting the members of the audience to paid subscribers because audience is paying already, but actually to engage with the audience and create loyal audience for them. I structure the syllabus of the training that should be that will be adopted for the needs of the, of the newly appointed audience editors and its focus on their existing and possible future digital platforms and products, web, social media, and new, new platforms. And at the end, what I propose, and I think it's really very important, is giving a chance of regional networking of these 
audience editors because of many things. They will have a chance to share their knowledge and experience. Um, they will not feel alone because they will be probably the only one dealing with that kind of data in their newsroom. So they will have a chance of talking to their peers in the region. Also, they can share metrics and data about the interest of the regional audience that we all share. So this capstone is actually just the beginning. This is something that my organization is planned to work on in the next couple of months. So I really hope I will have some concrete results to share in, in, in next period. So if you want to get more information or if you want to work with me on this challenging task of digital transformation of European public broadcasting media, please let me know. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Jeka. Up next, we have Alex. Uh, Alex uh, is, has held several leadership positions throughout his 30-year career. Uh, cur and he currently serves as the interim executive editor for the Miami Herald and El Nuevo Herald. Welcome, Alex. Thank you, Kyle. And uh, thank you uh, to all of you for being here uh, this morning to uh, listen to our presentations. Uh, again, I'm Alex Mena. I'm the interim executive editor of the Miami Herald and Nuevo Herald. I have to say that at 50 years old, I never thought I would be back in school. And uh, it is really something else. And I'm really happy that I was given this opportunity. I'm grateful uh, by the encouragement given by my company, McClatchy, to apply for the CUNY's Executive Leadership Program at Craig New York Graduate School of Journalism. And to CUNY for accepting me as part of this great cohort, it has been an unforgettable experience for me and obviously for all my other colleagues that have been here it's really really wonderful experience since the beginning of my career i have always thought we as journalists do what we do for our community in the past 10 months at cuny learning from professors staff and my cohort my beliefs have been even further solidified it is about the community that community that community through my classes and the readings a topic that interested me quite a bit has been the membership model because what's more community than members wanting our stories to be shared for all to read. So over the past 10 months, I decided to look into what this is. Is the membership model the solution for some? So I looked at the differences, first of all, between membership and subscription. Members feel a sense of pride. They want to, the brand to survive, want to give universal access. They do it for the community. Subscribers, a little bit different. They want information. Perhaps they want the physical paper, they want access to online content, likely given access to others, not a priority on their list. So what is a membership model? Allows members of the community to pay a fee for access to our content, provides different levels of paying membership, offers events, conferences, and exclusive access to content creators, opens opportunities for diversification of revenue sources and finances. What are the benefits to the company? Well, stable monthly cash flow, lower cost for marketing, because once you have a member, you don't have to market to them. Members are more active, so there's quicker feedback if you're not delivering on what they want to see. It's a better way also of getting data from members because you will know what events they like and don't like. They're going to be more interested in sharing their thoughts with you. How does it work? Well, you have to create an easy to follow membership tiers that give flexible options for joining the community. Could be a fan level, and those folks want to read content at low cost. Could be a supporter level. They want to read content and help provide free access to others. I call it advocate level, the next one, which is basically the folks that really, really are interested in the news organization thriving within the community. It could also be a bundle model that allows companies to actually buy subscriptions for their employees. You have to know the target audience. Local, for example, members want to read about their communities and their successes. Leaders want to read about what government entities are doing for their communities. There has to be a commitment to marketing. We have to be able to use our email system, our current list, to be able to provide prospective uh, members the information they need about membership. Social media, use current platforms to get out a message. Call to action, give current readers a way to donate or join. We have to also create content that is friendly for our readers, things that they want to read and things that they want to do. What others are doing, you know, in South Florida, WLRM Public Radio, they offer three tiers to members and they offer three tiers for sponsors. Everything is free. 
with no need to register or give any type of information. Why it works for them? Well, the community already knows that public radio and TV are doing it for the community. The Guardian, for example, offers five tiers for members. They also have, you know, every story has a call out to provide a way for folks to donate or to become members. The Chicago Sun-Times, very similar to The Guardian, they also have small donate button at their homepage that kind of follows everybody. After your third story, you have to sign up for a newsletter to continue reading for free if you don't become a member. Why does it work for them? The community knows the brand. What do members get in this model? In some cases, monthly events that only members can attend. At a fan level, perhaps these members could attend in-person sessions where we hear what they would like for us to do. But we have to take action on the listening sessions and give them something that they know uh, they can get after the session. Supporter level gives access to exclusive reporter sessions, perhaps, so that they can learn how the reporters go about their business. Another level of access could be going to editors' meetings, where they can see how we decide you know, the coverage for the day. Also, it creates a sense of community. Monthly events will create a sense of unity within our members. So really, is the membership model the solution for some? I think it is worth thinking about, and for some companies, maybe worth exploring. So thank you so much for uh, being with us today again, and looking forward to hearing from you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alex. All right, up next, uh, we have Lucy. Before I introduce Lucy, just a reminder, keep the chat going. There's so many good uh, sharing and learnings happening in the chat here. So please keep that up. Um, and it is, once again, so wonderful to have you with us here um, for this, uh, our capstone presentations. I know there's, uh, it's a long event, but I appreciate you all uh, sticking with us here for our last few presentations including Lucy. Uh, Lucy is the Europe editor of, of Pictures for Reuters, and she's based in London. So welcome, Lucy. Thank you very much, Carl, and hello, everybody. Um, yeah, so as Carl said, I'm uh, the Europe editor for Reuters Pictures. Um, I started this new job at the same time as the CUNY program began, um, and I moved from LA to London. I took on leading around 190 staff and freelance journalists, visual journalists in 50 countries. And I've been leading some of the cha most challenging stories um, in Europe, the war in Ukraine, we had photographers on the ground in Russia, the Turkey-Syria earthquake and the UK coronation. So I'd like to just really start by saying such a huge thank you to my wonderful instructors and to my cohort for the support and, and encouragement. Um, I really couldn't have got through the last year without you, and I learned so much from all your experiences. So thank you very much. Um, I used the leadership lessons from CUNY to guide me. Um, I created a new organizational structure. A re region was previously run by three people. There were a very low percentage of women on staff. So I hired seven new women, and I increased the number of assignments given to women. I've been tracking gender and ethnic and racial diversity in major European markets. My CUNY capstone is a strategic plan to guide Reuters pictures. It's based on three pillars. The first one is that the future of journalism is visual first journalism. My wonderful mentor, Shazna Nessa, global head of visuals from the Wall, for the Wall Street Journal told me, if you want to grow, you have to listen to what audiences want. We have to get better at respecting the story in whatever format is best. My dream is that we're saying more often that the visual can be the story. There's a direct business connection. Every year, the Reuters Institute Digital News Report surveys audiences and whether they prefer to read, watch, or listen to news. Whenever I see prefer to read, this is what I picture, the internet circa 1996. The report consistently finds that audiences prefer to read news. I think that the missing part of this picture is that audiences are reading and seeing. Most successful digital news is visual. Photos, video, audio, graphics, data visualizations. Photos play a large part in this. I talked to Nadja Nielsen, digital news director at the BBC. What she said about photography is what we're hearing from many broadcasters who are growing their digital footprint. The right photo tells the story and connects the viewer emotionally. The photo is the port into the reading. 
The future of journalism is also mobile first journalism. 50 to 75% of audiences used mobile to access news in most major markets last year, according to the Reuters Institute Digital News Report. Visual journalism defines news brands, brings in audiences and keeps them reading for longer. And this has been true throughout all the stages of digital transformation. The future of journalism is also verified photo photojournalism. It will likely involve tech solutions to help build trust. Camera, software, and mobile phone manufacturers are developing their own image provenance infrastructure in response to generative AI. Adobe has been working on the content authenticity initiative for a few years. Cryptographic hashing of images is processor intensive. Current prototype cameras are able to take one frame per second. So establishing prov image provenance with technology will be, will be, at least initially, applied to photojournalism before video. Photojournalism will play an important part in retaining audience trust in news. For my capstone case, case studies, I talked to the creators of some of the most successful news subscription models in the US, and many have invested in original photojournalism. The New York Times digitized its archive of 6 million photos, this project was based on the belief that investing in giving the New York Times a distinctive look with its own photojournalism archive that reporters were easily able to search would contribute to commercial success. The Wall Street Journal created tappables. They're a mobile and web format to bring in new audiences. They're photo-based storytelling with video and text slides. They're not behind the paywall. They don't have ads and they're a way to attract younger potential new subscribers. They're search and mobile first. Research shows that an audience will read 50% of a story on average, but they will look at all the photo and video content. Knowing this means we have to be deliberate about the visuals. Who we have behind the camera and how we visually portray different communities can build or destroy trust. Photography can play an important role at a time of declining public trust in media. Thank you um, to my inspiring mentor, Shazna Nessa, and, and to all of you for listening to this presentation. I really appreciate your time. Um, please reach out if you have any questions. Thank you very much. And here's her contact information if you want that as well here on the screen. Have a moment there for you that. Awesome. Up next, we have Amber. Amber is publisher and general manager of The Emancipator, a digital publication reimagining the first abolitionist newspaper of uh, for a new day. Welcome, Amber. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you so much. I started this program when I was 37 weeks pregnant, and so it's been a journey, and I thank my instructors, um, and I thank my, uh, my capstone um, mentor very much for your help uh, in this process. So I'm the, fa the founding co-editor of The Emancipator, and we are a digital publication reimagining the first abolitionist newspapers for a new day. We launched in the wake of the horrifying COVID health disparities, and the so-called racial reckoning. And we launched to meet the moment. Thousands took the, to the streets, corporations made big money promises to do better. And now that we're three years out and I've transitioned to a new role, I'm asking myself about the purpose of the emancipator right now. How can we meet the moment that we're in now? How can we evolve? There are some challenges. We launched as a collaboration between the Boston Globe and Boston University's Center for Anti-Racist Research. Um, but that partnership is over now and we are fully housed at BU and we're trying to create new systems and frankly, fight back on some bureaucracy. So we're a startup and we need a proper business plan so that we can find stability and change the journalism world. And in this post-racial reckoning, we are looking at how we can meet that moment right now. How can we evolve editorially and financially? But first, as I said, I became the publisher after being a co-editor uh, this spring. And I had this question, what is a publisher? What is my role? So I decided to seek advice from some of my fellow publishers. 
first I thought about the OG publishers, you know, the abolitionist newspaper publishers that the emancipator came out of this tradition, um, also to the legacy families who've owned papers and run them for years. Thankfully, I found these modern publishers. Uh, this spring, I interviewed these 10 publishers and CEOs. They range from running small nonprofit digital startups to digital pioneer monsters uh, and legacy organizations. And many of them faced similar crossroads at one point. Some spent their year their years as uh, reporters and, and editors and never thought of crossing those lines into the forbidden territory of the business side. But a moment emerged where they knew that they were the person to step up. And so here are a few things that I've learned from them in my conversations. Here's how Walter White defined the publisher role. You help decide and put a stamp on the strategy, making the bulk of the decisions to move the company forward. You have to have the personality to keep people together. Rebecca said this about clarity in her role, and I really related because I had a co-editor at first and we did a lot of the same things. She said that they, we realized that me and our editor in chief, we had to make sure we were separately making ourselves responsible for different parts of the organization. We really needed the buck to stop somewhere. Melissa Bell reminded me that the publisher role is in some ways fraught. It's not just about content. Um, we need to be seen as publishing. We need to be seen as engaging in journalism. We shouldn't be seen as just publishing something. Let's talk about fundraising. First off, I haven't moved to the dark side here is what Carol said. It's not that there's no cognitive dissonance in what you're doing. It's just that the cognitive dissonance can't be journalism is noble and fundraising is low down. So we really have to fund this work somehow. So let's find a way to do it. Um, Madeline was encouraging, sharing that she learned to listen to herself more uh, and to the community that she's serving than to take rejections personally. And when it comes to philanthropy, um, Lauren Williams at Capital B also talked about impact and how many funders are measuring impact um, in different ways. And that model is a bit broken. Uh, this piece advice, uh, people always say follow your heart, but I think you should follow your effort. Um, this is a piece of advice that Melissa Bell said her co-founder Ezra Klein gave her. And I connected with her on this one because while in my heart, I always feel like I'll be editorially brained. Uh, my effort has been in going into creating space for people who want to do amazing work, and I've been gaining comfort with that. And I've been gaining comfort with how we position our mission, our vision, and our value. And we talked about in this course, our value proposition. What's the problem we're trying to solve? I've been meditating on our value proposition. We are exploring solutions to racial inequality, how it impacts us all, and what can be done about it. We are the place for journalists and racial justice scholars to translate complex ideas, and we're filling the gap. So I have big goals in this next six months to the next year to hire new staff. We are building a new website. We're setting forth a new operational strategy. We're going to define our audience better, fundraise, and secure new uh, editorial content and partnerships. So I hope you'll please follow along um, our journey as journalism innovators. Thank you. Thank you so much, Amber. We have just four presentations left, so we're, we're getting near the end here, um, but we have some wonderful, uh, incredible capstones um, that we're excited to share with you coming up, including Blake. Blake is the founder of the Vengal Grassroots News Agency, a decentralized news organization training and mobilizing creators to help newsrooms expand their coverage across underreported areas. Welcome, Blake. Thank you so much, Kyle. As you said, my name is Blake Stoner. And today, um, I'll be talking about how we at Vingo, we're focused on building an action-oriented supporter base. So the caps, our capstone serves as a foundation to galvanize the national community to support Vingo's mission by crafting ways for supporters to play roles in scaling our work. 
And just a quick overview of Bingo. Our newswire helps newsrooms extend their content strategy at a fraction of the price of hiring personnel. We use grassroots principles to train local experts to create affordable ways to cover underrepresented areas. Our services help publishers source the photos and videos they need from the lens of vetted local creators. Our work helps media organizations not have to parachute into communities they don't know or that don't trust them. And our grassroots network curates a more intimate level of storytelling and helps news leaders meet their editorial goals even quicker. The catalyst for Vingal was the discovery of news deserts that leave communities without a voice. In 2015, I experienced this problem firsthand on the ground in Ferguson after the death of Mike Brown. I realized communities like Ferguson without consistent news infrastructure needed a decentralized way to gain regular, more intimate coverage. And plus with the rise of generative AI and the proliferation of artificial media, these voids have become an even more serious problem for communities. At Vingle, we're building trust and combating misinformation at its origin through securing the provenance of content with public ledger technology. At a high level, it works like this. Reporter, reported content is registered as digital evidence, collecting location, time, device, and reporter ID. The transaction is captured on a public immutable record, and a public receipt is generated to confirm the who, what, when, and where around the content's origin. And at Vingle, we've explored and reported on news deserts in over 20 plus cities across America. We've built systems to help secure their narratives too. And now we're focused on establishing ways to add more value to newsrooms in a sustainable manner. And as a bootstrapped news organization, we realize the number one problem that we need to overcome is how to build our community and mobilize our base in ways that help us grow and connect with more communities. And throughout the program, we've realized our core supporters are the following. Obviously the news community. Journalists interested in deeper levels of storytelling and new ways to curate verified content. The decentralized tech community, tech advocates who believe in decentralized tools that can be used to prove the provenance of content we see online. And the grassroots community, people on the ground in communities um, doing the hard work of ensuring that different demographics get proper representation. And during the program, the team and I work to secure key alliances to help advance our community building strategy. Some key supporters are the following. Starling Lab for Data Integrity. Star Stanford and USC's co-founded lab focused on intersection of journalism and Web3 problems. Brown Institute for Media Innovation at Columbia Journalism School and Stanford Engineering. The Online News Association. The Internet Archives Decentralized Web Community. And we're currently global mm -hmm. challenge finalists at my T2. Moving forward, we decided to launch something new called the Vingo Creator Alliance. This will be a community space on Discord to help galvanize our supporters all in one space. The hope is that this community space will serve as a hub to not only build our base, but also spur new collaborative initiatives. And for those starting something new, my key advice is to find your community and keep going. When doing important work, one of the main things needed to keep your momentum high is a high level of community support. By finding community here at CUNY and with other like-minded leaders across America, I was able to do that for Bengal. And moving forward, we'll be continuing our work and research at Columbia. With that, we'll be furthering our community building efforts in Georgia as we kick off an initiative to cover urban versus rural healthcare access uh, for perspectives across the state of Georgia. And we'll be also planning a crowdfunding project to support our next chapter as we seek to roll out our own grassroots coverage of the 2024 presidential election. And I wanna close by saying thank you to everyone here at CUNY and my entire cohort. This community has made an incredible impact on my journey. And also I wanna ask all those in media listening to please take Bengals five minute content survey. It'll help us tremendously in our next steps. You can scan this QR code or you can click the, the link that'll be in the chat. Thank you so very much. Thank you so much, Blake. Give you a moment, grab your QR code, use your phone to get tail, help him take a survey. All right, up next we have Walter White. So Walter is the publisher and senior vice president of Seth Communications. Uh, he has held leadership positions for 26 years and he's created numerous successful marketing and advertising for print and digital publications. Welcome, Walter.
Good morning. I hope it's all well, wherever you are. Minority newsprint is in trouble. The way to correct some of our issues will be to make the transformation to digital first. Transformation to a modern digital first newsroom for small legacy minority owned print publications. Objective and overall purposes to provide small legacy minority owned media a pathway to transformation from a print format to a modern digital first newsroom. This transformation is necessary to help restore profitability and extend the life of these much needed businesses. From history to current challenge, in the beginning, created around the 19th century to fill the void for truthful, comprehensive, and respectful news reporting in minority communities, past 200 years, contain commentary on needs and lifestyle of the minority community, overall impact, promotes a sense of unity, dignity, and truth-telling, unify minority and uplift minority communities. Current challenges, print media faces declining subscriptions and advertising revenue. Current audience obtain their news from non-print sources. Transformation pathway to a modern digital first newsroom, shift mindsets. Understand current best practices. Decide pace of transformation. Outline specific next steps. Seek and win new revenue streams and audiences. Shift mindsets, legacy print mindsets. Print will always work. The current skill base will work. The current audience will remain loyal. Our current avenue base is loyal. We can, sorry, our current advertising base is loyal. We can hang on a few more years. Modern digital first mindset. There are many new platforms, whole new set of skill set is needed. New targeted audience are needed. Advertisers have shifted. There is no hanging on. Understand current best practicing, reskilling and reorganizing, recruiting new staff, determining preferred channels that advertisers use, identify new target audiences. Decide the pace of change. How much funding is needed? Do we have access to the needed financial resources? What skills are needed by current staff and can they be upskill what new skills are needed? Can we recruit new staff? How quickly can we really change? If we have to take a phased approach, what are the steps? Assuming we will run forward with the transformation, when do we start? On, on the screen, you see two organizational charts, a legacy and a modern newsroom you will need to start with a modern newsroom organizational chart to begin the transformational process to the digital platform. Seek and win new revenue streams and audience. Target audience, minority, Gen X, millennials, and Gen Z. New revenue streams, advertising partnerships, newsletter, podcasts, e-blasts, and video. Thank you and have a great day. Thank you so much, Walter. All right, we are down to our last two presentations here. Uh, so I am excited to welcome uh, Thomas. Uh, he is the Chief Operating Officer uh, for a media group based in Bamberg, Germany. Thank you for being here, Thomas. So hello to everyone. My name is Thomas Seller. 
I'm the Chief Operating Officer at uh, Meeting Pop Oberfranken, a media company based in the southern part of Germany. My Capstone project deals with the introduction and implementation of uh, total quality management into my organization. In my opinion, a very important tool for us to fasten our digital transition. But I want to start from the beginning. For many, quality management is a somewhat unwieldy term that, from my experience, does not arouse enthusiasm in editorial departments. It refers to all activities that are necessary in the company to control, ensure, and improve the quality of its products permanently and sustainably in all areas and at all levels. In the run-up to my project, I also surveyed my managers and found that each of my editorial teams had developed its own mechanisms to ensure quality. For example, internal and external feedback, best practices, and our editorial wiki. However, we did not practice professional, continuous, uniform quality management in my division of MGO. That's why I formulated three expectations for quality management at my company. At first, we need tangible quality standards and comparable benchmarks of quality assurance to the entire editorial team, and open failure culture is necessary. Second, quality management must be a matter of the editorial teams and remain close to our working methods. They need to take responsibility for it, and it must be tailored to the needs of the individual areas. And third, quality management must not lead to bureaucratic effort or acceptance will suffer. To develop an efficient quality management system that my teams would accept and that helps us keep the promise of quality to our readers, I looked at various models in our media companies and industries in fall of 2022 and came across total quality management, TQM. Its originator was William Deming, an American physicist who was first successful with it in the Japanese automotive industry. Deming also came up with the plan, do, check, act, PDCA cycle. He describes four phases to design quality processes, quality planning, production, control, and improvement. I've been inspired by Deming's ideas, but what does that mean for my editorial teams in concrete terms? My Capstone project consists of four phases and nearly 20, 20 sub-projects. I've already completed three of these phases, which involved introducing the TKM methodology, new planning processes, convincing unions and stakeholders, technical sub-projects, the special reconstruction of our newsroom, changing workflows, and many, many other things. The final phase has started in July, or will start it in July. I'm working right now on the reorganization of the editorial companies with the aim of still implementing TKM-oriented control mechanism that will be completed by the end of Q2 24. I also started the optimization of quality management and tried to strengthen the innovation culture. But what are the learnings of this project? Especially in the first phase, I may have informed my teams too early. In some cases, two months passed between the presentation and the first noticeable changes, and that's why colleagues were sometimes surprised by the coming changes during implementation. Not all stakeholders were able to cross the dimension of the project in this phase. In the second phase, I underestimated the persistence of the Works Council. That's quite similar to the union representatives in US. It was not only always easy to get all the resources needed, costing me more time as planned, especially with the doc IT interface project. And in third phase, the teams feel a lot of uncertainty because of the coming changes, which is dangerous for more and ultimately for business goals. Therefore, team building measures are also important in this phase. After initial successes, we must not lose the sight of the project's overall goals. But now to the most important question. Would I use TPM again for the change process in my organization? Yes, I would. I still think it's the right method to accompany the digital transition in my editorial offices. Even though sub-projects docked onto TQM, such as new planning uh, processes or the structural reorganization of the editorial team will not be completed by the end of this program, a positive balance can already be drawn. For example, conversions in the first quarter dribbled. At the same time, the length of time readers held their subscriptions increased. And more important for me, in the editorial offices, we start talking about content quality again. 
Therefore, my outlook for the digital transition initiated in my area is optimistic. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Thomas. All right, last but certainly not least, uh, we have Ariel. Ariel is the incoming Director of News Experimentation at LAist in Los Angeles. As she works at the intersection of community engagement, editorial, product, and revenue strategy to ensure LAist journalism consistently serves and centers Angelino's needs. Okay, take it away, Ariel. Thank you, Kyle. I'm just going to move this camera down because I am five feet tall, significantly shorter than Thomas. <laughs> Thank you, everybody, for being here today. Um, I'm going to be speaking about my capstone, more than a thought exercise, operationalizing user needs in a local newsroom. First off, to situate things, LAS is a local newsroom with public radio roots in the messy middle of digital transformation. We're operating in a very crowded local market in Los Angeles. We knew that tactical improvements to our digital presence wouldn't be enough to guarantee sustainability in this crowded local market, that we needed to offer something different. We didn't wanna be in an optimization race against other outlets. We wanted to be in a different lane entirely. At the same time, we knew that we also needed a decision-making framework that could help us make audience-centric decisions on a daily basis. This is where user needs come in. They're a big topic in journalism right now, but what are they really? They're an alternative newsroom taxonomy that begins with the needs of the public you serve. In early 2022, we had just wrapped up our own user needs research in LA. Our core research question was, what props Angelinos to participate in public life? We emerged with the model that you see on the screen. Above the surface are the stories that simply inform people that meet their explicit need for information. Below the surface are the modes that Angelinos might be in when engaging in public, in public life and seeking information to help them do that. By serving these motivations, we can offer greater value and engagement. To put it simply, if we serve these user needs, our journalism can help, them do, can help them do something with their lives, not just inform them. We recognize that this homegrown user needs model offered an audience-centric decision-making framework and a path to differentiation, a unique value proposition. But it would only become a true advantage if our operations could align with it. We needed to reorganize the way that we work to bring these needs to the center of our organization. My capstone picks up when the research is done and the implementation begins. The first challenge that I had to navigate was that of advancing change in an organization with change fatigue. After listening to your audiences, you need to turn around and listen to your newsroom, ask questions, resist the urge to offer quick solutions. This is how you identify what language resonates, what's confusing, and what existing problems and processes you can connect the change to. That last question is especially key in a change fatigue organization. People aren't looking for new innovations. They want consistency and stability. So situate the change in things that they're already experiencing. An example of that, a reporter mentioned to me in the listening tour that they've been getting asked for years, who is this story for? So I frame the modes as an answer to that question. Tracking wins like these will help you tell strong internal stories and also identify where the change is lagging. Along the way, consistent language is key. Provide your leadership with talking points on the change, including what it isn't. Too many ways of talking about the change will cause whiplash and make this feel like a passing fad. But to build comfort, it's important to offer flexibility at that application phase. Give people time to play around with the change in a low stakes way. The second challenge I had to navigate was that of building the scaffolding. Your user needs need to be embedded in routines across the organization. This is how you will maintain the change. The first thing you need to do is identify the decision moments, formal ones like meetings, but also informal ones like Slack conversations. Then you need to identify how you will embed the change in each of those moments. Your listening tour will help you here. Many newsrooms document how to use their tools, but few document how to make decisions. Changes reinforced or undermined through dozens of daily micro decisions. You need to create documentation that helps people make those decisions that align with the change consistently. Research and product development happen at a slow, methodical pace, but when it comes time for implementation, you need to keep up with the newsroom, not tell them to slow down. And the last is to always be thinking about fit. When you have fit between your activities, they help maintain each other and support organizational alignment. Do a regular audit on when processes, outputs, and metrics are out of sync with the change. At the end of this year or so of implementation work, I have four key takeaways. The first is the importance of doing your own research. Working with another newsroom's user needs model is a good way to get familiar with the concept and play around with it, but a taxonomy completely imported from elsewhere makes alignment and buy-in harder. Staff members need to see your users in the data to get invested in it. 
The second structure is a way to support your organization. It creates predictability. It reassures people that they're doing things right and makes the change less unnerving. The next is that it's not about the news. It's not even about content. It's about local experiences and agency and helping people have more of both of those. That's the value of the work. Those are the user needs for a local newsroom. Last is we have this idea that change is always draining, frustrating, scary, but it doesn't have to be. The focus on digital optimization has left many people wondering to what end, but finding and exploiting a point of differentiation can give people a renewed sense of why and give them opportunities for creative, creative problem solving that they might be missing. This is a recap of our journey over the last year. And now I'm cycling through those sort of three stages at the bottom pretty continuously. And through this work, we've gone from an organization with change fatigue to one building in room and structure for experimentation. And I'm taking on a new role as director of news experimentation with our user needs at the core of that work. Thank you for here, being here. Weren't all of those projects just so fantastic? Congratulations to the 2023 Executive Leadership Cohort. Each and every one of them made every effort to craft brilliant capstone projects, do a final presentation here today. They attended many classes and workshops throughout the year too, all while juggling busy jobs, families, organizations, and lives. I also wanna thank Jeff Jarvis and Anita Zialina again, and the J Plus team, the faculty and staff at CUNY and say a big thank you to our instructors, coaches, and funders for their generous support. We're so excited that all of these brilliant leaders have really grown and developed their strategies, tactics, and thinking over the last year. And we're so excited to keep seeing their leadership journey develop. We wish them all the best. Stay tuned for more information about the next cohort, which will kick off in September. Thank you all so much for joining us today. Let's give our class of 2023 one more big round of applause. <laughs> Thank you all so much and goodbye.